string of horrific attacks by Hamas against civilian targets have once again plunged the Holy Land into chaos. And while that's incredibly tragic, it's also incredibly predictable. Israel and Palestine have, of course, been at each other's throats for a very long time. At this point, it's basically an intergenerational ethno-religious blood feud, and it's probably not coming to a close anytime soon. However, there are some important lessons to learn about what is happening here. First, the nature of this conflict and why it's suddenly become a global issue. You see, this conflict did not stay confined to the Middle East. All of a sudden, right after it hit social media, it was announced people got news of these attacks. This flooded into the streets of many Western cities, places like New York, Paris, Toronto. All of a sudden, there are masses in the streets, two sides, each waving foreign flags, not the flags of the countries that they're in, not the host country, but in instead flags of these two foreign adversaries. They have signs, they're chanting at each other, they're saying horrific things, wishing the end of each other, and of course, in many cases, also violence followed. And the question you want to ask yourself is, why is this conflict between these two small nations all of a sudden a huge issue? It turns into street fights and protests and screaming and flag waving in all of these Western cities. Why is this behavior, this feud from the Middle East, suddenly transplanted and placed into all these different Western cities in many different nations across the globe? And the answer is, of course, mass migration. One thing that most of these Western nations have in common is that they have been embracing multiculturalism, that they have embraced open borders or mass migration. And in many cases, that migration has come from these states, from these foreign nations, where these conflicts are going on. And this is just one of the wages of multiculturalism. This is just one of the wages of trying to have these open border policies, trying to bring in many different peoples, many different nations, many different languages, not bother assimilating them at all, having any kind of process where you slow things down and maybe add a few people a year who might be valuable, but, in, but instead just allowing large waves of unmitigated immigration into your nation. This is the natural consequence, because when you do that, when you have that approach to the sovereignty of your nation, you are welcoming in every conflict from around the world. The world is a nasty and brutish place. There are many ancient tribal showdowns, centuries old, that continue when they reach the shores of these new nations. People do not magically touch the dirt of the United States or England or France and suddenly gain all of the values and all of the temperaments and all of the traditions and all of the religion and all of the things that make those nations what they are. They don't suddenly magically transform into people who have all of those values. Instead, they bring their backgrounds, they bring their traditions, and they bring their identities with them. And when they bring those identities with them, they manifest on the streets of these nations. So the answer to this is, of course, pretty simple. Any nation that values its existence, any Western nation that wants to continue being a nation and having the kind of standards of living and the kind of cultures and the kind of way they conduct themselves, the same moral vision, the same identity, they're going to need to stop letting large amounts of people enter the nation and transform it. They're going to have to stop letting people from all around the world bring their identities, bring their conflicts into the nation so that they can once again get together and wave flags at each other and scream that they want to get rid of each other and have violent clashes in the streets. You do not want this kind of gang tribal activity happening in your nation. That is just not desirable. But it goes another level deeper. That's obviously a huge issue. But I think the one that's really interesting for the purposes of linguistics and theory that has been happening is the use of the phrase decolonization. Hey guys, like most of you, I have fond memories of waking up at the crack of dawn, excited to watch all the Saturday morning cartoons. Mom didn't want to wake up that early on Saturday, so that meant that we got to pour a bowl of our favorite cereal for breakfast. 
They tasted great, but of course they were full of sugar and not that healthy, which is why it was a treat. But now Magic Spoon has an alternative to the cereal that you love that has zero sugar but still tastes great. Magic Spoon has reinvented your favorite childhood cereal to taste great, but each serving has zero grams of sugar, 13 to 14 grams of protein, and 4 to 5 net grams of carbs. It's a keto-friendly, gluten-free, grain-free, and soy-free way to relive those moments watching your favorite cartoons. Plus, it's only 140 calories per serving. Now Magic Spoon has taken the magic in their cereal and transformed it into an on-the-go snack with the brand new Treats. You can have a totally delicious, high-protein cereal bar for breakfast, dessert, or any time in between. They're just like the marshmallow treats you had when you were a kid, but with only one gram of sugar and one to two grams of net carbs. And they're packed with 11 grams of protein per bar. The treats come in two flavors, marshmallow and chocolate peanut butter. Whether you like sticking with the classics or trying something new, there's a flavor that you'll love. I know you can get kind of skeptical when you hear about a sugarless high protein cereal bar, but let me tell you, they actually taste great. The marshmallow one is my personal favorite. So head to magicspoon.com slash Oren to grab a custom bundle of cereal and try the magic for yourself. And don't forget to add the brand new marshmallow and chocolate peanut butter treats. Be sure to use the promo code Oren at checkout to save $5 off your order. And Magic Spoon is so confident in their product, it's backed with a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. Remember, get your next delicious bowl of cereal at magicspoon.com slash Oren and use the code Oren to save $5 today. Now, many of you have probably heard this when BLM was getting big, when we got a lot of the woke stuff, a lot of the critical race theory stuff. We heard a lot about colonization and decolonization, right? All of the Western empires, especially, you know, all these white countries are considered colonizers. You know, they, they and of course, many of them did have colonies. That's true, right? The, the age of colonization was real, but of course, colonies are not in any way specific only to Western or white or Christian nations. Colonies have existed for a very long time. You can go back to the days of Greece and Rome and, you know, all these ancient empires and civilizations, uh, African nations colonized each other. Colonies are a very common thing that happened throughout human history. You may not like the fact that empires are real or that colonization is real. That might be something that makes you uncomfortable. That's very understandable, but it's also true about history. And it's not uniquely true about America or England or France, though they might have been some of the most successful colonizers, especially in recent memory. But this is, again, is not something that originated with these nations. But that doesn't really matter. Of course, that's not part of the narrative, just like for Black Lives Matter and for critical race theory and wokeness. Slavery began in the United States as the only nation that ever had it. It's somehow a unique institution to the United States. They basically treat the same thing when it comes to colonization. That's a uniquely Western or uniquely uh, white or a uniquely Christian uh, formation. It never happened anywhere else, even though the history of the world is, is rife with it. They just ignore all of that history. And instead they say, oh no, this is part of white supremacy. This is part of the patriarchy. This is part of you know the, this kind of Western mentality of conquest. And so they are constantly deriding it. They're saying that's what's holding everybody down. And so a big part of their idea is to decolonize things. So they want to decolonize the education system. They want to decolonize the university system. They want to decolonize the police force. And what they're saying with that is that they want to purge the influence of what has become the majority culture or what was rather the majority culture of those nations. They want to get rid of those who are in power, which they see as majority people of European descent or what they call white people. They want to get rid of that existence. And instead, they want to bring a different paradigm. They want to bring people from their communities into it. They want to shift that and change that over time. And so this is the idea of decolonization as it has been explained by many people. However, we saw a very interesting shift here recently when it comes to how decolonization is used. A lot of people have noticed that that is not just a word about changing systemic bias or getting rid of racism or something like that. It's been very clear for a while that there is another element on top of that. And of course, you would have known that if you paid attention to the rhetoric, because the thing that most people don't pay attention to is the fact 
that colonization and decolonization, these are not new terms to the woke lexicon. This is not a sudden invention of critical race theory that's been added to you know, accelerate the conflict inside our political landscape. This is something that has been deeply rooted in leftist ideology since at least the 1960s in America and probably earlier in many other communist revolutions or Marxist revolutions. This has been language that has been around for a very long time. This is something that was explicitly used by left-wing radicals in the 60s, especially in the halls of academia. And this has, of course, been sitting there stewing for a very long time. It's been working its way into the ideology of our educational institutions, of our elite vanguards, of our ruling class. So this is not a new word. This is not a new idea. This didn't just come out of nowhere and suddenly radicalize people. However, people have been making the connection between the idea of decolonization and violence. And one of the things that has brought that to the forefront has been the approach of many leftist organizations to the tactics of Hamas. In fact, the BLM branch from Chicago posted on social media an image supporting the Palestinian action, the Hamas action against civilians with the paragliders that were used to come down and shoot concert goers in Gaza. So they are directly showing their support through this idea of decolonization for violent action. Now, of course, they're doing that in the context of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, but it's very clear that they think of this as the same phrase, the same word that they want to use when they're talking about how to take action in the United States and England and France and places like this. So there's a consistent interest in violence. That's what they're talking about when they're talking about decolonization. It's not the overthrow of some oppressive system. It's not the removal of systemic racism. They're talking about real violence. And this became very clear. There were several high profile accounts that came out and talked about decolonization on places like Twitter. And they said, hey, what did you think decolonization meant? You thought this was just about academic papers. You thought this was just about you know, marching in the streets and having cool slogans. No, it was always about violence. And this is now a very mask off moment for many people. A lot of people who are saying, oh, well, you know, this is bad. We're against it. These are the wacky liberals with their crazy new social justice project. You know, they were looking at that language and they they didn't like it, but they didn't understand the implicit violence behind it, the implicit threat behind it. But this is always the case. When these people were talking about decolonization, they always meant attacks on civilian targets. They always meant attacks against the police. They always meant attacks on government buildings. And in case you didn't understand that, during the BLM riots and the Antifa riots, that's exactly what they did. Many people have now completely forgotten, due to the media blitzkrieg around events like January 6th, that BLM and Antifa were extremely violent, especially towards authority figures and towards government buildings. They went to the White House and protested. They were so violent and so out of control that the Secret Service was worried about President Trump. They went to places and sieged government buildings in leftist cities. Of course, we had the Chaz. They declared an autonomous zone. There was a warlord for crying out loud. These people have been attacking not just you know, the idea of racism or they haven't been just trying to hunt down some kind of phantom bigotry somewhere. These are people who have been actively showing that they are interested in violence and the organization involved, again, in those Antifa riots, in those BLM riots was very intentional. Weapons were carried. People were prepared for battle. They were ready to siege buildings. They were ready to clash with other protesters and cops. Antifa had specifically planned and had practiced these techniques so that they could get into combat effectively with police without actually triggering certain things like arrests or shooting, that kind of stuff. They had planned this stuff from the beginning to be violent. They were ready to do this. And this is a key thing that people need to understand. The language of decolonization was never purely ideological. It was never purely academic. It's not there just to sell books to suckers who run corporations and get them to hold seminars on how their employees can be less white. 
This was always a plan to directly bring violence against innocent civilians in the United States, in places like England, in countries like France. That was always what they meant. Now, of course, if we had real governments, if the United States had a real government and not a regime that hated it, they would be keeping an eye on these people. They would be enforcing the law. They would be treating these people as terrorist threats because that's exactly what they are. That's who they venerate. That's what they want to be. They say it out loud in public without any hesitation. But instead, the Biden administration is targeting, you guessed it, Trump voters, MAGA people. You've got a red hat. Oh, you're in big trouble. You're going to jail. You've been making memes like Douglas Mackey. You're facing 10 years in jail. You're somebody who happened to be standing outside when a riot occurred in January 6th. You're going to jail. That's what they're focused on. The FBI has been very clear. These are the people they care about. The difficult truth is that many Western governments are on board with this narrative of decolonization, or at least they do not directly oppose it. They are leaving borders open for a reason. They understand where this comes from, but they're allowing people to continue to pour over the border and bring these ideas with them, bring these grievances with them. They're obviously allowing terrorist organizations like Antifa and Black Lives Matter to continue to organize, to continue to use this rhetoric. And not only do they do that, they don't even monitor these people and they don't count it as left-wing violence. So if you wonder how they come up with these miraculous statistics where all of a sudden it turns out all the domestic violence is right-wing, all of that stuff happens to be MAGA supporters, none of it's left-wing. Oh, well, that's because they specifically do not count Antifa as a real organization. Christopher Ray, the director of the FBI, said it's just an idea. They don't count BLM as left-wing violence. So, of course, it doesn't show up, and it looks like the right are the only ones interested in any kind of conflict. And so they are specifically helping this language to seep into our culture, to seep into our different institutions, to radicalize people who are already unstable. They are looking to set a match to a powder keg. And that's why the reform of many of these institutions is simply not sufficient. These universities, places like the FBI that are completely corrupt, I'm sorry, but they have to go. It's not enough to just say, oh, we'll get rid of some of the bad actors. No, what you have is a malicious organization from the ground up supporting an ideology that explicitly intends to wield violence against the population. And again, if you had any questions about that, if you were unsure as to the nature of their argument, they have made it extremely clear over the last few days. So this is the lesson to learn here for conservatives. And I really hope it's a lesson that's not too late, but so much ground has already been lost. I'm not sure. When you look at people making arguments for getting rid of history, tearing down statues, rewriting our history books, relabeling everything racist, relabeling everything as problematic, part of the patriarchy, part of the evil white Christian mindset, when you see people doing this stuff, you can't sit around and say, oh, this isn't going to affect me. This isn't going to affect my kid. I'll just get my kid out of public school. I'll just make sure to start my own business. Those things are good. Like those are things that can shelter you personally and can shelter your family some, from some of these effects. But when you see people making these arguments, they're never going to just stop at that stuff, even though that stuff already was bad and you already shouldn't have allowed it. It's critical to understand that when people bring these kind of arguments, when they start targeting the nature of your country, the tradition of your country, the identity of your country, and they start attacking its heart, its core, it is never about peaceful reform because when you are attacking something at that kind of fundamental level, what you're really talking about is the people themselves. It's not just ideological. It's a conflict aimed directly at the people who are currently in the nation, who run the nation, who define the nation. That is what they are looking for here. When they're talking about decolonizing you, they're talking about getting rid of you. And you cannot allow that kind of rhetoric to flourish.